Welcome all to um, this uh, webinar on prostate cancer and treatment options. We're going to go through a bunch of slides and uh, try to familiarize you with prostate cancer. I do a lot of prostate work, both uh, BPH type of work for enlarged prostate that's non-cancerous, but then I'm also um, very well versed in dealing with prostate cancer too, as we certainly see a lot of that. So I appreciate Boston Scientific putting this together uh, because it's very important in general, but this is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month and we wanna highlight uh, prostate cancer so folks um, are aware of what it is and what it's all about and what we should be doing about it. Um, as Joely said, please ask lots of questions through the chat. We'll get to them at the end. And if we have to stay a little bit later to, to get to all the questions, we will. Um, and so I'm gonna start moving through our slides here, if it'll let me do that. Let's see. Joely, I won't let me do what I would normally do. Let's go down here, we'll do it this way. Okay. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am a, not only a Yankee, but I'm told a damn Yankee because I've been down here now for about 25 years. Uh, I'm from Boston, originally the Boston area, um, did my undergrad at Yale, uh, actually did my degree in English literature and, uh, spent then time working on wall street as an investment banker, working in healthcare and technology, um, made my way eventually to medical school, uh, graduated, uh, AOA. Uh, honors from Einstein in New York City, did my residency down here at Emory, and I've been down here ever since. And so uh, that's kind of my biopsy or my, my biopsy real quickly, not my biopsy. Um, what we're going to do tonight is really talk a little bit about prostate cancer, do an overview of the anatomy, some of the statistics, how we diagnose this, and then treatment options. And then what we're really going to focus on is a newer way that we deal with patients um, who undergo radiation therapy. And that's kind of the focus of what we're going to do tonight. So we're not going to focus on uh, robotic surgery or prostatectomies. We're not going to focus on cryotherapy or newer things like, you know, high intensity focal ultrasound. We're really going to focus at the end on radiation therapy and on space or, which is something that's really helped with uh, limiting side effects for this, um, for this type of treatment. And so as you can see here on this little cartoon, uh, this is a, a, a cartoon of the male body. The bladder sits up here, urine fills into the bladder, and goes out through the urethra at the end of the penis, goes right through the middle of the prostate. And the prostate really is put in a very, very difficult place in the body. It's dab smack kind of in the middle of the pelvis. Uh, the rectum sits right behind it. The bladder sits right on top of it and the urethra goes right through the middle of it. And so we'll talk about why that's important uh, in a little bit. When we look at statistics, about one in nine, a little bit less, one in eight and a half men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in his lifetime. And the old adage is, if you live long enough, you will get prostate cancer. And when we do autopsy reports and look at um, the incidence of prostate cancer, uh, men in their 80s have about a 70% chance statistically of having prostate cancer. Uh, most of the time it's, it's a small amount and never gonna cause any issues. If you live to be 100, you will have a 100% chance risk of having prostate cancer. So when we do autopsies on 100-year-old men, all of them have some prostate cancer in their prostate. So it's kind of inevitable, but most of the time prostate cancer doesn't cause any issues. Um, even though it is a slow-growing type of cancer and even though it's very prevalent, I think that this statement here is very important, which is it's the second lead, leading cause of cancer death in American men behind lung cancer. And in fact, it's the number one type of cancer that we men get behind skin cancer. So when we look at non-skin cancers, prostate cancer is by far the most common type of prostate or the most common type of pro uh, cancer that we see. So again, looking at some of the statistics, uh, the 2018 estimates based uh, that we compiled in 2019, there were about 165,000 new cases of prostate cancer diagnosed in the United States, about 30,000 deaths from prostate cancer. And so even though it's slow growing, even though if you get it, it's very slow growing and your chances of survival are long lasting, we still lose about 30,000 people per year in this country to prostate cancer. And so it's an important thing, not only to diagnose, but spend some time discussing with your urologist what treatment options are and whether treatment is even appropriate for some of our older patients. Um, 
These numbers are also very important. So if you were to be, if you were to be diagnosed with prostate cancer today and it was localized, your five-year chances of being alive, the five-year relative survival rate are greater than 99%. If you had all stages, so even for those patients who have uh, advanced prostate cancer, when we throw those numbers into the mix, the five-year survival rate is still 99%. And when we look at 10-year relative survival rate for all stages of cancers, it's about 98%. So most people who get diagnosed with prostate cancer in this country are getting appropriate treatment, and most of them are still gonna be around in 10 years from a prostate cancer standpoint. Now they may get hit by a bus, they may have a heart attack, but from a cancer standpoint, they usually survive with prostate cancer uh, quite a long time. So how do we diagnose prostate cancer? Um, there, there's two ways that we diagnose prostate cancer. And the first one up here, screening, is by far the most important one uh, that, that we do. Let me skip to this non-screen detected prostate cancer quickly because it's not very prevalent at all. So patients typically do not, let me repeat that, do not have symptoms when they have prostate cancer. So they do not get pain from the prostate cancer. 99% of the time, they don't get urinary symptoms from the prostate cancer. They don't tend to get any bleeding from the prostate cancer. Prostate cancer tends to be silent. It doesn't cause symptoms. And so when patients come to me, and as I mentioned at the outset, I see a lot of patients for BPH and, and voiding symptoms. And they say, doc, you know, I've been getting up twice a night. I'm going more frequently during the daytime. You know, do I have prostate cancer? My answer always is yes, you may have prostate cancer, but it has absolutely nothing to do with those symptoms. And so prostate cancer doesn't cause symptoms. Infrequently, we will see patients who come in, sometimes they're in the hospital with severe, severe uh, bone pain. Uh, they haven't been seeing a doctor for 10 years. They haven't had any blood tests, any PSAs. They haven't had any exams. And what we eventually find is that the bone pain is due to metastatic prostate cancer. That would be the one instance when, you know, we end up working patients up because they presented with those types of symptoms, but very, very rare for that to be the case. So let's stop back up here at number one with screening. Um, the way we screen patients, importantly, is with PSA, and everybody's probably on this call is familiar with that blood test. It stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's a blood uh, or it's, a, it's an enzyme that's made only by the prostate. Nothing else in the body makes it. Women don't have any PSA because they do not have um, uh, prostates. And uh, if you take a man's prostate out, their PSA should go to zero. And so PSA has had a bad rap over the years. Uh, it's been written up in numerous articles and Wall Street Journal and people say it's no good. PSA is very good when it's used appropriately. And so, you know, most urologists and certainly all the urologists in, in Georgia urology know how to monitor patients with PSA and looking at PSA values over time and making sure that you use the same lab so that you have consistency in the, uh, in the blood draw that you're getting is a very important way combined with the DRE, the digital rectal examination once a year to follow a patient and screen a patient for prostate cancer. That's the most basic way that we do that. And we in the urology arena still feel very strongly that it's important to do both a PSA as well as a digital rectal examination every single year on patients who are in appropriate age groups. Most of us will probably stop doing the blood draw, the PSA, once a patient hits 75 or 80, because as I said earlier, most of those patients, if you're 80 years old, statistically, you've got a good chance that there's gonna be prostate cancer there. It tends to be slow growing. It doesn't tend to be one that's gonna cause you any problems or any issues. And so why chase that diagnosis if we're not gonna do anything about it? So we screen patients every year. We do the PSA, we do the digital rectal examination. If we see an abnormality, if we see a spike, if we see something we're concerned about or feel something we're concerned about, the only way really to get the diagnosis of prostate cancer is down here, it's the biopsy. The biopsy is critically important because it gives us tissue. It gives the pathologist the ability to tell us what kind of cancer we're dealing with, how aggressive the cancer is, and give us an idea of how we can counsel our patient. So once we get you screened, we go down here to the biopsy if it's appropriate, and this is the only way to confirm the existence and severity of the disease. We can't do an x-ray to tell you how bad the disease is in the prostate. We can't do an MRI. We can't do a CT scan. We can't just do an ultrasound, which doesn't really show prostate cancer. You have to get tissue to make that diagnosis and figure that out.
So just again, cartoons of how we actually do the biopsy. Most of the time the biopsy is done over here, what's called the transrectal approach. And it's actually not done with a patient lying on their back like they're showing here, but the patient lying on their side, we put an ultrasound probe. This little probe here goes into the rectum right where our finger would go to feel the prostate, which is sitting right here. And we use the ultrasound to guide us to take biopsies from that prostate. The vast majority of prostate cancers are going to occur in this back side of the prostate. About 90% of them are going to be back here. And so that's where we focus our attention. Sometimes we will do uh, what's called a transperineal approach. We see that in patients who don't have a rectum. So some patients have had uh, colon cancer and rectal cancer and had their rectum removed. Uh, sometimes we need to go through this area here in order to take biopsy specimens. Um, depending on where you are in the world, depends on whether or not you end up getting transrectal or whether you get transperineal. In this country, the vast, vast majority of the time, 98% of the time, we're doing transrectal biopsies. When patients are given appropriate antibiotics and they're appropriately counseled and, and you do a good biopsy, there shouldn't be any um, untoward side effects from doing that. So those are our two little cartoons. Once we get tissue, what do we wanna find out? So let's say we do find prostate cancer on that biopsy. The th major points of what that uh, pathologist needs to tell us is what the Gleason score is. And that's like Jackie Gleason, but, but not have anything to do with Jackie Gleason. And the Gleason score really is a way for us to assess the severity or the aggressiveness of the disease. And nowadays they put patients or they put scores into grade groups of one through four, but really most of us still depend on the Gleason score. Uh, the lowest or the best you can be is a Gleason 6. The worst that you're going to be, the most aggressive angry cancer is going to be a Gleason 10. Uh, and so very important for us to know that. Um, we also like to know what the T stage is. Uh, and we talk about staging cancer, whether or not the cancer is inside the prostate, outside the prostate. The most important part of that is when we feel the prostate, whether or not we feel any cancer. Uh, and that's part of the digital rectal examination. Once we diagnose cancer, most of us will do some imaging, CT scans, bone scans, PET CT scans nowadays we're also doing to give us the extent of the disease. So is it just inside the prostate? Has it gotten outside the prostate? And then obviously the PSA test is gonna play a role in trying for us to figure out how aggressive that disease is. Some of the other factors that we look at, PSA velocity. So folks who've had their PSAs go one to 10, 10 to 50, and then we diagnose them. If it's that quickly that their PSA is going up, that can be a bad factor. Genomic testing is looking at the genetic profile of the cancer cell itself. And this is becoming much more prevalent in lots of type of cancers. It really kind of started in breast cancer. Uh, we do it now in prostate cancer. And it can help us to help tell our patients how aggressive the prostate cancer is and especially those patients who are contemplating doing active surveillance, which we'll talk about in a second, it helps us to determine whether or not that prostate cancer has factors that uh, make it a, a, a more aggressive tumor when we don't think it does. So the genetics of that tumor can really tell us that. How much tumor is there? That's the volume of tumor. So somebody who has just one core positive for cancer versus 10 cores positive, uh, it's a different type of cancer. And then we use some other risk, risk assessment models and labs and other tests that we can do, all in helping us counsel the patient as to how aggressive the cancer is, how, how much we think it's going to grow and how quickly it's gonna grow in the future so that we can make appropriate you know, treatment decisions on taking care of those patients. So common treatment options, uh, I mentioned at the outset cryotherapy, we're not talking about cryotherapy uh, and, and HIFU, high intensity focal ultrasound, which we're also not talking about. By far the vast, vast majority of patients in this country and around the world are getting treated either with surgery or with different types of radiation therapy or over the past five to eight years, we're seeing a lot more active surveillance. And so all of these different types of treatments can have risks and side effects and something that we have to consider when we're counseling our patients. And so when we look at radiation therapy, what kind of radiation therapy are we talking about? There's two main types. There's radiation that we're gonna bombard the prostate from the outside in. So patients on a table, a gantry swings around that patient's body. It sends radiation into the prostate through the body. That's external beam radiation therapy, whether it's 3D conformal or intensity modulated or stereotactic or proton beam or gamma beam or gamma knife. 
Those are all different types of external beam. And then the other type of radiation that we use sometimes is internal radiation, radiating the patient from the prostate or the prostate from the inside out. And that's when we talk about brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is the seed therapy. So if you've had friends or family members who've had seeds put in their prostate, that's what we're talking about when we talk about brachytherapy. And then there's some different types of those as well. When we talk about surgery, honestly, nowadays, 99% of patients, if you're having surgery, you're getting this bottom one here, the robotically assisted laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. Um, patients asleep, little poke holes going into the body, instruments put in through those holes, camera goes in through the belly button, bring a robot over the patient's body. The robot arms are connected to all of those little instruments. And then the surgeon sits basically in a little video arcade booth looking through special goggles that allows him or her to see the inside of the body in three dimensions. Hands fit into special gloves, move the hands and the fingers, that moves the robot arms, does the surgery. And so again, 99% of the prostatectomies that are doing nowadays are be, being done that way. Less invasive, faster recovery time, less blood loss, more precise. Over here on this active surveillance, uh, as we mentioned, most of the active surveillance studies have come out of Northern Europe. So out of Sweden and Finland and Norway. And basically what they found was that if a patient uh, is an appropriate candidate, if they have very low grade or low risk prostate cancer, uh, then following that patient actively is a viable way to treat that patient or follow that patient. And I think it's very important when we talk about active surveillance, that the word active means that we're gonna to continue to, to make sure that that prostate cancer doesn't become more aggressive. What the bet is that we make in somebody who has prostate cancer who go on active surveillance is that patient's gonna live 12 years and 12 years they're gonna have a heart attack and die from the heart attack and never were bothered by the prostate cancer. And so in order to make sure that that's the case, we have to continue to follow the patient and make sure that that low grade, low risk prostate cancer doesn't become more aggressive uh, or something that we need to deal with. So it, it's not okay, I'm gonna go on active surveillance and then disappear for four years. We really do need to keep on top. We, the urologists need to keep on top of those patients uh, and make sure that that prostate cancer doesn't become more aggressive because if it does, we wanna know about it before it crosses that line so that we can still go and do radiation therapy or surgery and still salvage a cure for those patients. So that's kind of where active surveillance comes in. The risks and side effects that we get most concerned about from these therapies, the radiation and the surgery are bowel, urinary and sexual side effects, okay? And we'll talk about those in just a second. So focusing now on radiation treatment, there's a little picture of you know, the patient lying on the bed, here's the radiation arm, it's gonna swing around, it's gonna treat that patient. Uh, what is radiation? How does radiation work? Uh, radiation actually disrupts the cells uh, of all cells that the radiation uh, sort of goes through. And so we try to focus it on the area where we want the cells to die. Uh, that's obviously the prostate itself. When somebody has prostate cancer, we don't just focus on those areas in the prostate where we know there's cancer. We want to treat the entire prostate. Just because we've done biopsies, typically 12 little cores of biopsies from the prostate, doesn't mean that we didn't miss several areas around the prostate that uh, could be cancerous. And so it's very important that we treat the entire prostate. Seemingly, when we take a prostate out, we're taking the entire prostate out. We don't just take out pieces of the prostate that might have the cancer in it. So we really wanna do that. So the radiation goes through the cells, it's gonna kill all of the prostate cells. But the problem is that the radiation has to also go through normal tissue to get to the prostate. It's gotta go through that bladder where we looked at that little cartoon. It's gonna go through the urethra, it's gonna go through the rectum uh, and some of the soft tissue that's around there. And that's where we get the side effects from radiation therapy. The bowel dysfunction that can happen can be diarrhea, can be blood in the stool, can be some soiling, some fecal soiling. It can be pain with bowel movements. And then the urinary dysfunction, needing to urinate more often, the urinary frequency, having burning, uh, what we call dysuria. When you urinate, you can see blood in the urine, you can have urinary incontinence, all from the negative effects that that radiation has had on the normal tissue in the bladder and the urethra. And so typically those symptoms go away over time, uh, but sometimes they don't. And so sometimes radiation, uh, radiation side effects are permanent and we wanna try to obviously avoid them uh, as much as we can. 
So we talked a little bit about the external beam versus the internal treatment uh, earlier. Um, we talked about these on the left. It's not important that you know what each one of these are, but we do do a better job nowadays of uh, making a three-dimensional model of the prostate on the computer. And then that information is fed into the, um, the uh, device that's delivering the radiation therapy so that we're not treating the prostate as if it's a sphere. We're not treating it as if it's a bowling ball and treating everything around it. So prostates have nooks and crannies and flat areas and bulges, and we wanna treat just those areas and try to avoid uh, anything around it. And so one of the things that we do much better nowadays than we did 15, 20 years ago is making those three-dimensional models and treating it appropriately. Over here, the seed implants, uh, the low dose rate implants are what we call permanent seeds. Uh, those are the sort of the old fashioned way of putting little seeds that give off radiation. They give off a low dose of radiation over a long period of time to kill the prostate tissue from the inside out. Uh, high dose rate brachytherapy uh, is what we call temporary seed implant. It's to give a patient a higher dose in a shorter period of time, actually a very short period of time over about an hour or so. And then we don't leave anything left over in the prostate. We take all of the little wires out that are delivering that, uh, that therapy. And so all these are different ways that uh, prostate um, radiation is given um, and they can all have side effects. And so these are MRI pictures and they're kind of hard to, to see or get a sense of what we're looking at. But on this picture here on the left, think of yourself lying on your back. Your head is on the back side of the screen. Your feet are sticking out where I'm sitting and we've taken a slice. We've cut, oh, we've cut your body um, in half. And so um, what we're seeing here, these are the hip joints right here. And then this is the prostate. And the most important part of this picture for you to see is right down here underneath the prostate is the rectum. And so you see that the rectum abuts, no pun intended, the prostate, it right, it's right next to it. And so that's why we can feel the prostate when we put our finger in here. And that's why we can biopsy the prostate. And when we cut you the other way, now you've got your backbone over here and your belly button over here. You can see here's the colon coming and wrapping behind and the prostate sits right here bladder sits right here. So radiation, when it's going through the body, is going to affect all of these organs that we have around the prostate. So how do we deal with that? What can we do to minimize those negative impacts on uh, the colon, on the rectum, and certainly from a urinary standpoint? That's where this space or came in. Uh, and space or it's kind of a neat name because it's going to put a space between the prostate and the rectum. And in fact, it's also going to put a space between some of the nerves that run down in that area that are important uh, from a sexual standpoint and also from a urinary standpoint. So when we looked at a bunch of patients, um, it was 551 patients, 269 of them got the hydrogel spacer or space or, uh, and the rest of them did not. And we compared them out over time. What we found was that there was a significant reduction in the gastrointestinal side effects that patients got. That was all of the, the, the bleeding in the rectum and the diarrhea and the pain with bowel movements. So 1% versus 6%. And then the genitourinary symptoms, the burning when you pee, the frequency, the urgency, uh, that was 15 versus 32%. So really significant difference when we put space or in these patients versus when we didn't put space or in the patients. And so when we look here again at the cartoon, bladder sits up here, prostate here, rep rectum coming behind, we put this little spacer in between the prostate and the rectum. And what that does is it pushes the rectal wall away from the prostate, and it also pushes those nerves away from where the radiation is going to be given to help minimize some of those uh, side effects. And so when we look at uh, a patient, this is cutting that prostate again in, in sort of the long way. So the prostate is here, but all of this around here, this colored area around the prostate, that's where we have the negative impact from the radiation. There's no way to avoid that. In order for us to give radiation and make sure that we get a good margin around the prostate, that radiation sort of seeps out and can affect right here, the rectum. So we see this whole area of the top of the rectum that's included in that halo, and that's something that we don't wanna see. So we get significant rectal toxicity. Now, the other thing, they don't put it in here, but I want you to realize that patients where the nerves are that run both to the urinary sphincter as well as the nerves that run and allow men to get erections, those nerves run right down in this area on this side and right down in this area on this side. 
And so they kind of run at five and seven o'clock if we were looking at this as a clock. And so when we put the space ore in, what we're doing is we're pushing all of that away so that radiation goes into the space ore, but doesn't go into the nerves as much and doesn't go into the roof of that rectum. Uh, it temporarily positions that rectum away and those nerves away and it's absorbable. So the material that we have in here isn't permanent, isn't dangerous, and it actually dissolves in about six months time when, um, when the patient doesn't need it anymore. So when the negative effects of that radiation uh, are over, then the space sore is no longer there. So it's made of a synthetic biocompatible non-toxic uh, agent. As we said, it absorbs in about six months. It's made of water is 95% is of what it is. And then polyethylene glycol. Polyethylene glycol is in lots of things, including the pills that you take and the capsules that you take. Uh, your medicine, artificial tears are made of polyethylene glycol. So it's a very inert, uh, benign uh, type of material and something that we don't necessarily need to be concerned about. The procedure when we put that space ore in, typically it's done as a little outpatient procedure. Um, we need to put a, a ultrasound probe in the rectum and then we inject that space ore right in between the rectal wall and the prostate in a liquid form. And then it combines with the other liquid that we inject and it creates that little gel, that little spacer that we have in there. Most of the time it can be done with some local anesthesia. I found most of my patients do better if they've got an IV in and are sedated a little bit, sort of like we do for when we do a colonoscopy. Uh, space ore has been studied extensively. Uh, when we look at all of the studies together, what we find is that we've got uh, the, the space ore has an eight time, or, or patients who did not get space ore are eight times more likely to have uh, bowel, urinary, sexual issues compared to the ones when we do do the space share, when we look at them at one, two, and three years. So it really has made a difference with the side effects of radiation therapy. And I tell all my patients who do choose to get radiation for their prostate cancer, that it's very important that they do go ahead and talk to their doctor about space ore. So when you have more space, you get fewer rectal complications, fewer urinary complications, fewer sexual complica complications and a better quality of life. And so I can't stress it enough. If you're gonna have radiation, and I do think radiation in the right patient is a good procedure for their prostate cancer. If you're gonna have radiation, talk to your doctor about having space or place beforehand. We, the urologists typically do that, even though the radiation most of the time is being given by the radiation oncologist, we work closely with the radiation oncologist to make sure that the space ore is placed to help limit those side effects that we know that can happen. Um, so by the numbers, greater than 75 peer reviewed publications. So this isn't something that's just new that you know, you've had one or two articles out there. We're using this all over the world. More than 50,000 patients have been treated. The number for that is, is higher than that now. Um, Yep, let's go back again. Um, it's reimbursed by Medicare. Most private insurers are covering it right now, but most of our you know, prostate cancer population is Medicare anyways. Um, and that's something that Medicare covers. So that's not an issue with that. Even if you're gonna have radiation you know, right after having your space or put in, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, and so if there are questions specifically about space or about radiation therapy, you can go to the spaceor.com website. There's lots of resources there that Boston Scientific has put up that uh, will help answer the questions. Uh, they've got a physician locator, you know, who are the physicians that do that? We in Georgia Urology have about eight or 10 physicians that do space or myself included. Uh, and so we can certainly get that taken care of. And if your physician in Georgia Urology isn't one that does space or, then we do them for those folks. Or if you're having radiation therapy with another urologist who doesn't do space or uh, talk to the radiation oncologist that you're working with, because really most of us in the urology community do believe that it's a good thing uh, to limit side effects. And, and most folks in the radiation um, uh, arena will also agree that, that it should be done, you know, if they're going to have patients that